Good evening, everybody. Pastor Jeff here from Abundant Grace, Assembly of God in Prudenville. Hoping you're all doing well tonight and uh, uh, hopefully maybe even experiencing some of the, the new freedoms that we've been allowed to have in the past week or so here. Uh, I know for our purposes here in our building, we have um, very um, designated areas where people are to sit to keep them away from each other. Um, but we have started coming slowly back in the house again, which is very exciting because we can praise and worship together and we can study together. And we have some different folks with us today than were with us um, before. And some of the folks that were with us for the past couple of weeks aren't here. So you'll see people coming and going, possibly. And what you will see is you will see a very definite um, growth in people. By which, of course, means that this is an invitation to you, too, to join us some Wednesday night or some Sunday morning or some Friday evening when we have a program called Celebrate Recovery for whatever is ailing you, uh, hang-ups, habits, hurts, whatever it is, and that meets at 7 o'clock on, on um, Friday evenings, and it gives you a great place to go for you can feel safe, secure, and you can, um, you can be open with people. Um, so it's a good program. So anyways, stop in and check us out sometime. Uh, you know, we have a, a pretty good congregation here. So what I'm going to start with here is a brief review. Um, this is the third week that we've been studying salvation. We spent the first couple of weeks basically going through the, um, some of the benefits of salvation um, and realizing that, stressing very importantly and very emphatically, that there is only one way to heaven and to eternal life with, with the Father in heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'll agree with it or not, it is a fact. Amen. So um, I'm just making a statement that um, you know this is where we stand. So we're going to be t tonight. We're going to have a pro maybe a fairly short lesson because it's going to be we 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 talked about salvation, but now we're going to go into some of the. Um, components of salvation. Tonight we're going to be studying redemption, and then next week we're going to be studying justification, because it is very important that those two terms particularly get separated so people understand, and sanctification as well, because they, are, they all mean different things. Um, our material tonight comes from the um, Fire Bible, which is a Bible that our pastor, Pastor Dennis, our senior pastor, um, having served as a pastor for more than 35 years, he felt that um, we should be versed in most of these lessons um, to have a very basic, grounded understanding and, uh, of the Bible. And it's very simple that this Bible uh, has notes just like any other study Bible, uh, but its notes are Pentecostal in nature. So that is why, we've, that's why we have adopted this, because we are Pentecostal people. We believe in Pentecost. So all the verses quoted uh, are from the Fire Bible, in the, and they are from the English Standard Version, and they are from either the Global or, I mean, the Global or the Student Edition. It makes no difference, um, but that's where we're getting our material from. When I, read a, when I ask somebody to read a note, I want you to know that those notes are not mine. I wish they were. Um, because they're very well written, but they were actually written, they're from the Fire Bible itself. So I want to give credit where credit's due. So, with that, I think we'll open up with prayer. Um, Bruce, do you want to pray for us, please? Thank you, Father God, for bringing us here today. And I, I ask you to just come into our hearts as we, as we go over your word this evening. And, and uh, just be with those who... who didn't show up who's been here recently and, and and just 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 be with him this evening for 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 your glory in Jesus name amen. amen amen so we are in week three and we are um, studying biblical words for salvation and our text that the lesson is built around is from Romans 1 16 which says for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. And I say definite amen to that last 
praise because we are Gentile. Or Greek is Gentile, and we are Gentiles. Um, so praise God that we're by grace, by His grace and mercy, we are now counted as Amen. one. Amen. There is no more Jew or or Gentile. So the root meaning of redemption, um, the Greek for that would be apolytrosis, is to be ransomed or bought back or restored by the payment of a price. It also implies being rescued, liberated, and set free. The term redemption points out the means by which salvation is obtained, by the payment of a ransom. The concept and teaching of redemption can be summarized as follows. <coughs> Uh, before we even need to get any farther, is there anybody watching or listening that needs to be rescued, liberated, set free from something? You need to be restored from a, a position that you've fallen from. Do you need to be re, re, regathered to where you were? Then this lesson is for you. Amen. So, um, and then to fully understand redemption, we first must realize our sinful condition. Because if we don't realize we have sin, what's, why do we need to be redeemed? And we've, we've discussed this before, that the, um, uh, the salvation is not something that, can, like it says, it can be obtained by the payment of, of a, or needs to be obtained by payment of a ransom. But you and I cannot buy our salvation. We, can, we don't have what it takes to purchase our salvation. There was only one way that salvation could be purchased. And I say was purchased because it is past tense. It was purchased for us by Jesus Christ at Calvary. So, um, so, and then apart from God, we are under the influence and control of satanic and evil powers. And we are slaves to sin, as Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 6, or ch chapter 6, verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And we're going to be discussing later on this, this um, subject of slavery um, and what it means uh, to be a slave by force or a slave by, um, by choice. But in the meantime, we're going to pass this over to Ms. Robin and have her do some reading for us, please. Apart from God, we are in need of rescue from sin's guilt. Punishment and power, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous night. Robert, then, before you are going to read that note, um, is, that, is that not a powerful verse? It sure is. Is that not a powerful verse? Um, I would even go so far as to uh, challenge some of you out there that may have never read the Bible. I challenge you to try it. Read the Gospel of John. Read Matthew. Tell me if that doesn't do something to make you think, at least think Amen. about something. But try it. I, I, I dare you. Just try it. See what happens. So anyways, um, I got excited there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the note for 1 Peter 2.9 is a holy nation. Believer, believers collectively are set apart for God and his kingdom as a holy nation and to proclaim the gospel of salvation to his glory and praise. All naturalism among believers must be tempered by this revelation. Well, so again, we're, we're open for comment, folks, just like we would be un, um, normally, but so I just want to make that mention, too, since we have some new folks here. Robin? Um, this, when you spoke about starting in John, I have been coming to church for a while, but we went to a woman's retreat and pastor had preached that Wednesday before, I think, on John or wherever, the Sunday before. And I sat up all that night, that first night that we went to the woman's retreat. 
and read John. Mm -hmm. And she, Bonnie would wake up and say, you okay? Yes, I'm great. I was so deep into the word, I couldn't put it down. And that next day, I, everyone woke up and I, I was a different person. Mm. I really was. That was the more, that was the shining light that I had completely submitted well, you know, everything to God. You know, too, John, you know, John is, John's gospel, just for those that are, are listening that may take my challenge, um, John is a unique gospel in the sense that it literally covers from the beginning and takes up through in the later chapters the wonderful, beautiful promise of the Holy Spirit. The last couple of chapters, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. But the last 14, 15, and 16, a lot, a lot, of, a lot in there about the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it covers it right from stem to stern. That's why John is kind of a unique kind of a gospel. Uh, just for you folks, for you folks that may be, um, like I said, taking my challenge. Well, now, we're going to pass it over to Pastor Bonnie. Grandma Bonnie. <laughs> I'm so happy I'm a grandma. <laughs> Another very critical thing we first must understand about redemption is the price paid to free us. Christ paid and secured the ransom by shedding his own blood and giving his life in our, in our place. Once again, we are going to turn to 1 Peter and read in chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Mm -hmm. And that is another powerful verse. Yeah. Um, and you wanted me to read the, the notes to go with that. And um, i got them right here. Come on. Chapter 1, verse 18, the note for redeemed, um, what it means to be redeemed or what redeemed is all about. Essentially, the term redeemed implies being purchased bought back or ransomed by the payment of a price. Jesus paid the highest price with his own life to save us from the death penalty that we deserved for sin. For example, our own God-defying way. In this sense, being redeemed also means being liberated from the power of Satan and sin and restored to a right relationship with God through faith in Christ. And then, and that, I just don't even know how I could add to that. That was a pretty powerful um, explanation of being redeemed. And then the next is the precious blood of Christ. Mm. Okay. <laughs> the precious blood of Christ. God's word clearly conveys the fact that Christ's sacrificial death is what secures the believer's redemption i.e. spiritual salvation, release from slavery to sin, restoration to a right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I'm no. sorry, but the precious blood of Christ. You know, I think of that movie that I just watched recently that Robin let me borrow. You know, and all through it, um, all through it, the guy is like not wanting to turn his life over to God not wanting to, you know, be redeemed, not really one, uh, not really understanding redemption. Mm -hmm. And um, he's kind of almost angry at God through the whole movie. And then finally, it's like he just finally, he's backing up and he's all frustrated. And he says, what did God ever do for me? And he slaps what's behind him. He feels something behind him. He slaps it and he pulls his hand up and it's all covered with blood. And he turns around and it's the cross. <gasps> And all of a sudden, he just fell to his knees because it finally hit him what God did do for him. And, mm -hmm. and this is, we have to come to grips with what Christ did for us and his precious blood being shed on that cross. What more could God do for us? He died. 
for us. He came as a human and died for us. What, what more could he do? <laughs> What's the name of the movie, Robin? Um, um, what is the name of the movie? <laughs> anyway, we'll tell you later. We'll figure yeah. it out. No, <laughs> but, one, but one thing too, folks, that you're going to be... Heaven's war. No, you'll notice that that, that note that, that Pastor Bonnie just read was very repetitious of stuff that we've already just, read, already just talked about. That is not an accident. That's on purpose. Because I want, not, I want to follow the lead of this, the writers of, this, of these notes and the writer of the Bible, which was ultimately was God. Um, and I want to um, uh, make sure that you understand that it's, salvation is free to us because of the price that was paid so again, just think about, let that sink in for, just let that sink in. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody's going to die. Um, and again, we've said it before, uh, where do you want to spend life after death from this earth? You want to, last couple of days have been kind of warm? You think you want to try that out down there a little bit? <laughs> or you can go up there into heaven and spend it with Jesus Christ and God the Father. Amen. Oh. Yeah. All right, Jeff, I will, I will be quiet now. I want to be my... on the winning side. <laughs> By the way, I'd be able to introduce my lovely wife of 40 years, um, two years before that. So we've been together 42 years. So my lovely wife, Kathleen, is going to do some reading. That just means we're old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sin is so opposed to God's perfect nature and character <clears throat> that it requires the most extreme penalty, which is death and permanent separation from God. There is no escaping that penalty without God's forgiveness, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It says in Hebrews 9, 20 through 22, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And there's a note on that. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Sin, which is an opposition, which is opposition, rebellion, and defiance toward God and his standards, is so radically opposed to God's perfect character that it requires the most extreme penalty, death and separation from God. Forgiveness can only be provided at the cost of life, but imperfect sacrifices could never permanently remove sin and guilt. Even our own lives are not worthy to pay the full price since death would simply give us what we deserve for defying God. Only God himself would provide a sacrifice that satisfies his perfect justice and pays the penalty for sin once and all, for all. God's provision came through the willing sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Again, you know, redemption, we're talking about blood. Uh, and again, for those of you that maybe uh, have stumbled upon this, um, not looking for it, and you hear a lot about this talk about blood, um, we're talking about um, blood as being used as, a, as an atonement for sin. In the Old Testament, it used to be done with an animal, um, but that wasn't sufficient. So that's why God sent his son down in human flesh to take care of that debt for us. Um, so we're going to move on and let um, Miss Peggy read some. Only God could provide the perfect and complete payment for sin. He did so through the willing sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' death provided the complete payment, and it is sufficient to cover all sin for all time. Those who accept his sacrifice for themselves and surrender their lives to him receive his gifts of forgiveness and eternal life, as John writes in his Gospel, chapter 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen. John says, Amen. Boy. Amen. And what, yeah, and then, uh, there's a note. <laughs> there's a note. Yeah. Tell me. 
the will of my Father. God's will is his desires and plans based on his character and purposes. Therefore, it is important to understand the relationship of God's will to human responsibility. One, it is not God's will that any believer should turn from a commitment to him and fall away from grace, separating himself or herself from God. For that matter, it is not God's will that any individual should perish or fail to accept the truth that can save them from spiritual death. Two, however, there is a great difference between God's perfect will and his permissive will, what he desires and what he allows because of our choices. Uh, he does not take away or deny the human responsibility to repent and trust Christ, even if it means that so many people will reject him and miss his perfect will for their lives. God, three, God's plan and desire to raise his people up at the last day to bring their bodies to life in a way that they will live forever with Christ does not release us from the responsibility of obeying his word and following him now. For those who continue to obey and follow him, death cannot destroy the life that Christ gives. Amen. Well, that word obey, that's where we have our problems, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we, we can't get into heaven with works, however, we do have a responsibility to walk right, walk rightly. And we're going to get into this. Um, this next part is, is pretty important as well because um, it, uh, it talks about, for instance, um, when you, one of the things I want to just real briefly touch on, when we talk about the last days, again, for those that may have stumbled upon this, we're talking about the rapture. We're talking about what will happen in the last days uh, when Christ comes back and he catches up, the dead will rise first, Former uh, Christians, and then if we're alive when that happens, we're going to follow them up. Hallelujah! And we're going to be up there with, with God in heaven. Mm -hmm. So let's see you there too. By the way, um, just an invitation. Um, so um, Bruce, would you read, please? See the result of being redeemed uh, by accepting Christ's sacrifice and forgiveness of sins and surrendering our lives to His authority and purpose. We are freed from Satan's control and from the guilt and power of sin, as Paul writes uh, to the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, uh, which is giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in, in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And I was going to have Robin read the note on yes, Colossians 1.13, so. Okay. Note for Colossians 113 from the dominion of darkness. Central to de redemption is deliverance from the dominion and power of darkness, i.e. from Satan. We are now in Christ's kingdom and under his rule. Again, uh, you're going to notice that I've, I've got a lot of repetition built in here. Um, and uh, again, that's not a mistake. So, Sister Lorena, would you carry on, please? Okay. This freedom from sin, however, does not mean that we can do as we please. Since God has paid the ransom for us, we become, become his property. Choosing Christ's freedom from sin makes us willing slaves of God as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, 22, 23. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. That's right. So again, you know, we're very briefly, um, I'm going to, uh, in fact, you know what, Pastor Bonnie, I know you don't like surprises, but you made a very good observation here shortly, uh, when we were talking a uh, short time ago, about the, um, the fact that this freedom is not license. Right. And, and, and um, so we want to make sure that people understand that, yes, we are free from sin if we are in Christ. We are, but that doesn't mean um, to 
whatever you know, whatever you're repenting of, to do it. Say, I'm sorry, God, and go and do it the next day. I'm sorry, God, and go do it the next day. I'm sorry, God. That's not. Well, so notice on. if you look at the terminology here, he says that if you are called in the Lord as a bond servant, then you're free. Yeah. And if you were free before, but now you're called, you've become a bond servant. In other words, a, you've chosen to be a slave for Christ. That's the part. Oh, yes. And it says you're bought with a price, which means Christ has paid the price for us to be His bond servant. But we choose to be His That's bond servant. That's the difference. Servant. That's the difference. And then it says, "Do not become bond servants of, of men." men. Which means that after we have become bond servants by choice of Christ, we have to be careful not to become bond servants of men. So we have that choice. Even once we've become a Christian, a lot of people say, well, once you become a Christian, you can never lose your salvation. <laughs> But this scripture makes it pretty clear that we can choose to be bondservants of men if we choose that. That's the opposite of being a bondservant of Christ. So we have to continually be aware. Uh, am I walking closer to being a bondservant of man, of, of people, of things, of the stuff of this world? Or am I staying a bond servant by choice of Christ? And it, every day it's a choice. Every day. And it, it is. It is. What, that, that, that's why we call it a walk, right? It's a walk. Yeah, yeah. that we walk out our salvation. Yeah, and, with and, fear and trembling. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, really, I mean, really. And the other, the, you know, the other, the other thing about that too is that's another, again, repetition, repetition. Um, another reason why we need each other, because. <clears throat> And, and and trust people enough to let, to say to them, hey, you, you have right to speak into my life. Like I've given right to basically anybody in this room, in this congregation, to speak into my life. They see me doing something, you know, wrong. Hey, buddy, tap me on the shoulder. Help me. Amen. You know, Help well, me. I'm sure there are people who who get who give their hearts to Jesus, and he they are immediately delivered from all their past bad behavior. They carry no baggage, they don't participate. But for most of us, it is a process. Preach it, sister. Amen. And we lose our desire for those things to, for the most part. But the flesh is still there. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, given, it's a constant ebb and flow of getting going along just fine and then all of a sudden realizing you've gotten into something you shouldn't have gotten into and then repenting and backtracking and starting again and starting again. It's kind of like addiction. They say that, that uh, falling off the wagon is part of addiction, that addicts will fall off the wagon and go back to rehab and do it again. And then, you know, and sometimes it takes them a few tries before they really get free of things. And we're not, that doesn't exclude us. Right. We are still included. We're still human beings. We still have the human mind. Never quit quitting. No, yeah, you never stop quitting, and you, and you, uh, yeah, you never quit quitting. Yeah, you know. I never, didn't hear that. that's a good. No, that's, uh, that's good it's stuff. It's just kind of like a marriage. You just have to continue to work at it every it is day. A and if you fall a little, you just have to do it a little bit harder yeah. next time. But Amen. It's a constant, everyday thing you do. I know it's tough. He is the her. bridegroom. You know, <laughs> yeah. it is a marriage. We are his wife. The yep. church is the spouse. Yes. The bride of Christ. Yes. Yep. That's what we're called. Yep. And I think that's one reason why it's important that we go to Sunday school and we're doing Wednesday night studies and everything. And because I know that it helped me grow in my faith and to, grant, to understand in the knowledge of what God wants from me and what it is to be a child of his. So it is important to put time into the relationship with God and with other believers to uphold you during those times. Well, I'd like to say commitment is not a dirty word. No. Mm. And, and making your com a commitment to the church to be there, 
or making a commitment to God that you're going to get up every morning and the first thing you're going to do is read the word. Amen. That's a commitment that you make. That's right. And it's good for us. Amen. Amen. It's Amen. good for us to make those commitments to God, and it's even better for us to keep them. Amen. Um, I'm going to let Pastor Bonnie speak in a minute, but I've got to use this statistic. I don't usually use statistics, but this one I've got to use because it's stuck in my head. I read it just the other day. Uh, when you are credentialed in the Assemblies of God, you get a magazine every month called Influence. And there's a page in the back. It's a full-page ad. And it... Um, um, it says that 62, if you read the Bible, now we, we, we've heard other statistics about if you read it 10 minutes a day, four times a week, you're going to be in a lot better shape than if you don't read it at all. But 62% of the people that study the Bible three times a week are more, 62% of them will share their faith with Christ. That's right. 62% of, of believers will somehow or another, some way, share their share Christ with people. You know, it can be it can be done in many ways, you know, verbally, it can be done in action and all of that, but still, that is very that's a big statistic. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad to be part of that statistic. Yes. Um, but it's not a hundred percent. Um and probably never it's more know, than half yeah, it's never not hundred. <laughs> so anyways, um Bunny hit something. Actually oh, Kathleen covered it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, perfect. It was perfect. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Kathleen covered it. I'm sorry. The New Testament teaching in re of redemption was foreshadowed and symbolized by various instances of redemption in the Old Testament. Um, the greatest Old Testament redemptive event was the Exodus. We took, you know, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the miraculous rescue and mass departure of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. In addition, through a system of sacrifice, the blood of animals was the price for atonement, i.e. the covering of forgiveness of sins. But as we all know, that didn't work, so that's why Christ came. I did want to, um, I'm not going to go into the Exodus, that's a long story. But if, if anybody has seen, yeah, well, Ten Commandments on TV, you've seen <laughs> uh, somewhat of a version of the Exodus. Um, and you, you cannot deny that that was, and that, and that is, by the way, that's a historical fact, too. So it's not just a, um, something that somebody, you know, someone can't claim, well, that's just the Bible. That is a, that is a, a historical fact. So with that, we're going to close tonight, and I'm going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask you if you have, again, if you're in need, if you're in need of, of being um, made whole, if if you're if you if you need to be restored, if you need if you need some redemptive the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, um, all you have to do very simply is you have to you do have to take some time um, to reflect and repent of your sins, and then after you've repented to God of your sins. Tell somebody that you and accepted him into your heart as your savior. Tell somebody, proclaim that news that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and your Lord. Don't let it just be a secret. And watch and see if your life doesn't change somehow. Watch and see, I dare you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.